Harpon Sports, the bar, audio, media, and radio network. What do we have in store for you on this edition of the program? Big Ten, big bucks. You know, now that the dust has settled a little bit, their billion-dollar-a-year contract coming up. Kevin Warren, the commissioner, wants to get to 20 teams. We explored that a little bit in the last podcast. Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports thinks something else is working. A revenue share between the Big Ten and its players. If this happens, it changes the game completely, and it would be a death blow for a couple entities. We're going to look at that. I'm going to start with that, actually. Other things on the docket. Nick Saban becoming the highest paid coach per year. He should be. Nobody's more valuable to his university than Nick Saban. He may be the most valuable coach, period, to his entity. Got us thinking. Which coaches are the program? Nick Saban is Alabama football. One of the Bear. Yeah, the Bear was great 50 years ago. Actually, almost yeah, 50 years ago. Not quite that long, but we're getting close to that. He is. There's about five other people that I think are the team, are the program as coaches. So we're going to explore that as well. Also, Miami, University of Miami, talking about at least some of the thought process here. You have big boosters starting to throw their hat in the ring for a new stadium on or near the campus. So they don't have to go the 30 minutes or 30 miles to Hard Rock, the old Orange Bowl. I get it. I get it. And it's how we tie that into the Big Ten where we start. The Big Ten is the most powerful conference financially in football. Talent-wise, it, it's the SEC. But financially, it's the Big Ten. Why? They're in bigger media markets. They're in bigger media markets. But all the talent is in the SEC. Most of the talent in the college football world comes from southern states. It's the truth. Not all of it. California does a nice job. Pennsylvania does a nice job. Ohio does a nice job in producing quality high school football players that go on to play college sports. They do. But the heart and soul of this stuff is in the South. And... The Big Ten knows this. The Big Ten, for years now, has been making financial move after financial move based on market sizes. Adding Nebraska really didn't do that. It brought balance. Adding Rutgers in Maryland was strategic for Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and New York. USC, UCLA was L.A. Now, you know, we have the rumor of the report that Oregon's talking. The four schools that the Big Ten would add that could be market supremacy that you, I don't know how you match it. I don't. Would be Seattle with Washington, Miami with the Hurricanes, Georgia Tech, and Notre Dame. If they would add Washington, Miami. Actually, take that back. If they would add Stanford, Miami, Georgia Tech, and Notre Dame, at that point, the Big Ten would have nine of the 16 biggest markets. And for anybody that doesn't understand market size and money and why this is relevant and why this is so important, is Dennis Dodd with a piece on CBS talking about the Big Ten when they get to 20? will be the first conference to do a revenue share with their athletes. NIL is one thing. When you have a billion dollar a year piece of the pie right now, and you had other major media markets, and that Big Ten deal gets about $1.4 billion, if Michigan and Ohio State and Notre Dame and Miami can pay their players with a revenue share from the school and you can't good luck. And Georgia tech and Miami come. Yeah. They're using those schools for their market size. So what you add Stanford, that's a top six media market with San Francisco. 
You had Atlanta, that's a top 12 media market with Georgia Tech. You had Miami, that's another top 12, top 13 media market with Miami. Notre Dame's the really only one that doesn't have the media market. But with Notre Dame, you just continue to pulse in and you just continue to roll in cash. If they can't get their hands on Notre Dame, then Washington slides into the equation with Seattle. It's another top 15 media market. And if the Big Ten really wanted to have some fun with it, if they really, really wanted to have some fun with it, they'd go Miami, Stanford, Georgia Tech, and if they can't get Notre Dame, they'd go TCU because that's Dallas-Fort Worth. That's what, market six? Notre Dame really wanted to really, really get in more money? Then go ahead, TCU. Now, academically, they don't fit in with what they want they, 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 what they want to do. They just don't. But, <laughs> oh, good gracious. It's all about strategy and it's all about cash flow. And to add these markets in this billion dollar contract and we'll just get more money from boosters. Boosters don't have a billion dollars. Not every year. TV networks do. They do. Like, well, And I remember having this debate all the time with people that were like ACC fans as opposed to SEC fans. And when the SEC was doing their network, it's like, well, the SEC payout per school, this is like 10 years ago. It's like, it's 20 million. Uh, the ACC is 13 million. They can make that up with revenue and boosters. When it was a $7 million cap. Cap. Now, per school. Now you're talking about a 30, 40, 50, 60 million dollar gap between the schools. Boosters can't make up that money. Over the course of a decade, you're talking close to three quarters of a billion dollars in certain instances, depending on the conference. The Big Ten on the cusp of a revenue sharing plan with its athletes. How can they do this legally? Well, this would be the this would be the breaking off of the NCAA, is what it would be. But when I mention schools like Georgia Tech, Miami, Stanford, because Miami, look, all of those schools, Georgia Tech, Notre Dame, Miami, and Stanford fit with what the Big Ten want to do academically. And they fit with what they want to do monetarily from the market size. All of a sudden, I'm rec- the, the, the Miami to the Big Ten thing is a big deal. This new stadium that they want to build is a big deal. Because if you're a Florida State in Florida and you're recruiting this state and Miami has $100 million a year that they can use to pay players, ugh. Even if they have $25 million extra a year to pay, but we can make that up with recruiting. Over the course of a decade, that's a quarter of a billion dollars. No, you can't. We make that up with, with what, fundraisers? You know, bake sales? There are already coaches. It cert- Look, there's already coaches. I know this. There's coaches at Florida going into frat houses asking for money to help pay for NIL stuff. Ooh, yowza. You have a bake sale? You have a raffle? 50-50 raffle? Is that how you're going to pay these guys? The Big Ten starts a revenue sharing plan with its players. It's pretty much at that point game over for the Pac-12 if they add multiple schools from the Pac-12. Can't keep up. You don't have the markets to keep up. Now, as long as the Pac-12 can keep Washington with Seattle and they can keep their hands on Phoenix and keep their hands on San Francisco, they've got enough big media markets to pull this off. The Big 12 is surviving because of TCU, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston coming into the fold because those are two of the six biggest markets in America. The SEC is fine because of all their talent. But once schools can start to pay talent, Ohio State comes to recruit you. And they say, hey, here's some money. We revenue sharing. You come to Ohio State, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a chunk of this sixty million dollars. You already saw how NIL can pry other people away. I, and I don't know how much money it's going to be when it's all said and done. The revenue right now they're talking like 10, 15 percent. 
Well, when you're talking about operating budgets and money coming in and payouts exceeding, you know, or, or coming in profits close to $150 million. The Big Ten shares its revenue with its players. Look, it's already going to crush Mac schools, and look, those guys aren't recruiting on the same level anyway. Who does it start to really, really affect? Think about schools from other conferences that are close to those states. Why on earth would you ever go to Pitt when you could go to Penn State? Why would you even consider it if they can pay you? Somewhat close now. Won't be for long. Why on earth would you ever go to Virginia Tech or Virginia when you can go to Maryland and make a million dollars? See, why on earth would you go to Florida, Florida State, when Miami can pay you a million dollars if Miami would join the Big Ten? Look at just telling you, if they are going to start paying players in the Big Ten, they're going to go after bigger media markets. Stanford, San Francisco, media market six. Washington, Seattle, top 15 media market. Boom. Miami, top 15 media market. Georgia Tech, top 15 media market. You can't get their hands on Georgia Tech, then you start doing the dance. Oregon, TCU, Notre Dame, they still won. And they may not stop at 20. The Big Ten looks at this like they're the NFL now. It's like, well, it's no longer geographically. You're right. They look at it like their own league. The Big Ten has an NFL-style contract, a network. Which gets us to Miami and their new stadium. Miami unveiled plans today. I want to make sure I get this right. 65,000-seat stadium near campus. Right now, Miami is 20 miles away from Hard Rock. It's not exactly on campus, but it's close. And Miami, this thing looks beautiful. They, it, I wrote on Twitter that they should sell this design to Jacksonville for the new stadium where the Jaguars should build. That's what they should do with this thing. Looks, it's beautiful. Where do we get the money for it? I know certain conference that just signed a billion-dollar-plus-year deal. The ACC can't help them with this. You can have boosters and donate as much money as possible. If you have an extra an extra $60 million a year rolling in from a TV contract, you get a new deal, you get an extra $50, $60 million rolling in, over the course of 10 years, you paid your stadium. Close to it. Miami wants this new stadium built. They should join the Big Ten. That's what they should do. Why not? too far away for our other teams only if they have fancy flying devices that can get you from miami to any big 10 city in the span of two and a half hours you know the strain it's going to put on them hmm. you mean the strain of miami going to boston college for a game and then the next week going to Pitt? maybe boston come a long way money 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 I'm telling you gang Miami wants this state, and it's beautiful. It's cool. They should build the thing. I get it. I get the lure of being on campus. I get it. I was trying to think of teams that are successful on campus. You know, you point to Heinz Field at Pitt. You know, sorry, formerly known as Heinz Field, but that's right there on the campus. Other places that, you know, for the longest time, Arizona State, you know, and Tempe, but that, again, technically, the Arizona Cardinals or the Phoenix Cardinals, but not really playing in Phoenix, playing in Tempe in their new. St- I can't think of any school that plays an NFL stadium that plays on campus with that stadium. The only one I can think of that's close is Pitt. I mean, how close is Temple to the, to the link? And that they don't fill that thing. That's another interesting team, media market size. Philadelphia's top 10 media market size wise. <laughs> I always thought the ACC would add them just so they can get their hands on them. But, There you go. That's what it's going to be. So my Miami's looking at this and join the Big Ten. Get your money. Get it done quicker. You're going to be talking close to when it's all said and done, close to $100 million, over $100 million per year per school. You start adding another three, four major media markets in here. It's all about the bracketing of the money. Miami should and needs to do this. You want your new stadium, join the Big Ten. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Big bucks. Speaking of big bucks, Nick Saban 
was it 93.6 million eight year deal Kirby Smart got the longest contract right Nick Saban's got the most money per year and is he going to be 71 is he going to, he's going to be 71 this contract would take him through his 79th birthday is he going to be there till the age of 79 no I don't think Nick Saban's there at the age of 75 but what this does do Anytime he goes into a recruit's house, and look, he's still sharp as a tack, so when he goes and talks to a recruit, you still want to go play for him. And the one thing that was going to be the knock on him going forward, if he had just like a five- or six-year deal, it's like, look, you get hurt or you get redshirted, he, he may not be there at the end of your deal. He's only got five years left. Now that it's eight years, and that's where in the NFL you can get away with a lame-duck coach. In baseball, you can get away with being a lame-duck coach. Why? Because these guys are all under contract, and it's not about getting somebody to sign a long-term deal there because they're going to sign for the money rather than the manager. In football, they sign sometimes for the coach. Go play for Belichick. I, I get it. Sean Payton, when he was with New Orleans, Andy Reid. I, I get it. But the most of the part, those things are just financial things. College football, it's about where am I going to play the NIL deal? Where am I going to be the most comfortable? Where Who's going to get me ready for the NFL? Nick Saban can still sell you on all of those goods. Having a basketball coach, four years is about where you are basketball, five years, because one and duns and, and things of that nature. But when you come to football, it's got to be at least a five- or six-year deal. Saban is an eight-year deal. They can make the money work better for eight years. It's about it, it's about securing him within that recruiting pool. But I was sitting here thinking about this. Nick Saban is Alabama football. Everybody thinks Dabble will go take that job after I think you take Nick Saban off that team, you you are two years away from eight and four. He, since his first year there, is 172 and 19. <laughs> Good God. Think about that. That was there. I was there for that for that first year where they went six and six and lost to Middle Louisiana Monroe and beat Colorado in the bowl game. What was that? I was in Shreveport. Um Nick Saban is 172 and 19 since his first year in, in Tuscaloosa. It's obscene. He is the program. And I was thinking about other coaches that are that institution or are that program. It was Mike Krzyzewski at Duke. He is, was Duke basketball. Retired now. I think Dabo Swinney is Clemson football. I think he's done that. Tommy Bowden had a little success there, but Dabo Swinney is Clemson football. He is. Kirby Smart's getting close. Kirby Smart's getting close being Georgia football. Nobody else in the SEC is that. They're not. I look around and try to find somebody else in college football. If he could ever win one at Michigan, you could say it for Jim Harbaugh. Ryan Day's not that at Ohio State. Lincoln Riley wasn't that at Oklahoma, and he's not that at USC. Not yet. Brian Kelly at LSU? No. No, no. Sarkeesian at Texas could be five, ten years from now. Nick Saban, Dabo Sweeney are the only two guys in college football that are their program. Basketball, it's easy. I, th th I think there's two in basketball now. Gino Ariyama is UConn basketball. And I think Mark Few is Gonzaga basketball. Not bigger than the program per se, but that guy is. They're, they're intertwined. They're connected. I don't think really as head coaches in sports, I can't. I only can think of one. The only one, I think of two. Bill Belichick is the Patriots, and Greg Popovich is the Spurs. He's like, well, Steve Kerr and, and Golden State, and I don't think so. Steve Kerr's in the same boat like where Phil Jackson was with the Bulls and the Lakers. It's like the star is bigger. You know, Steph, those guys are bigger. Popovich, the way he did it and the way he was able to move pieces in and out and had championships over different eras of their it, it, Greg Popovich is that. I think for a while there, you know, you look back a while ago and there, there are certain guys that you could make a case that, okay, they are that program. You know, like Jerry Sloan in the Jazz, but those days are over. Those days don't really exist anymore. But I do like this. I, 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 I was sitting here thinking about guys that the value and what they're worth and those that are bigger than what it is that they do. Roy Williams at North Carolina. See, Dean Smith, I don't even though he won more championships than Dean Smith. Bobby Knight was Indiana basketball. He was there. This guy, Joe Paterno, was Penn State football. Frank Beamer was Virginia Tech football. You know, if you do this 10 years ago, oh my gosh, it's a completely, totally different entity. But to me, Nick Saban, Nick Saban, Gino Ariama, Mark Few, Greg Popovich, 
Bill Belichick, Dabo Sweeney. Those guys are their programs and are their organizations. Harbon Sports, the bar, podcast, media, audio, radio network. Follow, share, like, subscribe at Harp on Sports Twitter, at Harp on Sports Instagram, Harp on Sports YouTube channel, Harp on Sports Facebook page. Consume us via the auditory route, as always. Apple Podcast, Spotify, Buzzsprout. Check us out on all three of those. And, of course, HarpOnSports.com. Going to get into our college football predictions next week. A little bit later on in the week. Again, I'm all about relevancy, baby. Whatever's the big sizzling steak, we cook it, we eat it that day. Remember, stay clean, stay focused, stay strong. Frankenstein, phone with your friend.